Uh, I want to talk to you about I mean, my work sort of divided uh, between uh, st studying where people live, that is cities and, and how they live, which is, has to do with work. And today I want to talk uh, to you uh, a little about, about work and uh, obviously this is a, quite a loaded subject about what's going to happen to work in our society. Uh, and I'm going to focus on one aspect of it, which is uh, the hope that we could get ourselves out of this horrible predicament by developing new skills, creating kind of new skill society. And uh, since this is such a, a thorny subject, and I am not its master, uh, what I'd like to do is speak to you for about 45 minutes and then just have a general uh, discussion. Uh, rather than a and a I'd be just very curious to know what you make of the issues that I'm raising, which I'm, I'm uh, I, I, I by no means uh, resolving. Um, it's, it's often said that uh, um, future of, of, of advanced societies like the US or the UK or Europe uh, lies in uh, developing skills economies. And you've got here one of the most distinguished uh, advocates of that, of, of that view, Robert Reich, uh, who argues that uh, in order to survive in global economy, the niche that the West will occupy is that of being a high skills society. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to look at the reality first of, of that prospect. And second, I, uh, in the second part of the talk, I want to talk a little about what do we mean by skills uh, and uh, uh, should we be looking at them in the way that Bob Reich looks at them as capacities for symbolic uh, uh, interpretation and interpersonal uh, exchange? That's his view of modern skill. And in the third part of the talk, I want to uh, focus on something that is uh, a particular interest to me, which is how we deal with skills that involve uh, new technologies. So that's the terrain I'll, I'll, I'll take in this talk. You've got to forgive me if I speak uh, informally. I've been speaking nonstop for the, it seems like, for the last two weeks uh, in the run up to the, the summit on work yesterday that was held in Washington. And I'm s my, my brain is a mess <laughs> by now, so <laughs> just stay with me. Uh, in one way, if you look at some kinds of data about this, we don't have any problem with skills. We are a skilled society. The CIA, bless its heart, does an annual uh, survey of human capital. And we rank right up there in the CIA's estimation at the very top at 99 out of a possible 100 points. Uh, others. Uh, other hum inde human indexes show a really much more tragic picture. For instance, uh, a, a UN, UNDP uh, index of human development, uh, which is actually based on research, um, uh, uh, has calculated that about 38 percent of the American workforce uh, is f uh, uh, functionally disabled both in basic math skills and about th uh, 32 percent are functionally illiterate. And these are measures of things like how, uh, whether people can balance a checkbook uh, or whether they can read more than six paragraphs out of a uh, uh, out of a contract uh, written in plain language and understand what they've read. I mean, these are basic work skills. 
Uh, another indices is actual um, uh, ability to, to make decisions about computer use. Uh, this is another U UN body that's studied this. And in terms of what they call computer competence, the US workforce ranks about 17th. So we're looking at a picture which of uh, something which uh, is not quite what it seems. And, and the gap is between uh, formalized measures of skill and actual uh, practical measures of skill. Um, there are some very simple reasons that are sometimes adduced for why we have this uh, problem. For instance, in 2006, uh, American school boards spent 600 times more on sports facilities than they did on science labs. So, I mean, this is, you know, therefore. Uh, um, another study that I'm quite interested in with UNICEF uh, brings out another dimension of this problem. This is a very depressing phenomenon. You know, uh, when you look at uh, UNICEF, did a study which you can get on on all of it online, uh, which was published in 2007, on the well-being of children in advanced societies. It studied 30, 33, you know, 32 uh, uh, um, developed societies, and they studied social factors like the degree to which children help each other with schoolwork, uh, or the amount of bullying that children receive in school. And the neoliberal regimes, the US, the UK, and Australia, are at the bottom of, of these measures. That is, it's very much rarer for American school children. I think the, the group is 11 to 14 to spend time studying together to help each other out and, and so on. And correspondingly, there, the experience of school seems to be a much more aggressive uh, 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 one for kids in that very important age range with lots of mutual aggression and lots of bullying than in uh, other countries. The top countries in this are, and this of course in a way won't surprise you, uh, the Scandinavian countries, which have, you know, well-established not only welfare regimes, but well-established notions of, of, of collective effort, uh, collective response. So that's, um, that's some of the landscape which uh, creates a s the question about that's what's going wrong, that something is if skilled society is our future, it's not a future that we're uh, embracing uh, uh, very well. Uh, I like just to say something about the economic side of this because this tends, all of these reports get tend to be blamed as you know there's something wrong with America or there's something wrong with Britain. Uh, um, as is, many of the commentators in the UNICEF study uh, had an almost gleeful reaction to, this, to these figures. And I think it's important to understand that, that there have been two structural uh, changes in the role of the neoliberal economies in the last 20 years, which could have uh, been weakening of the skills of ordinary members of, of them. Uh, one of them has to do with job export, and the other has to do, and that principally concerns manufacturing, and the other has to do with what's called career development, and that has to do with the service realm. And I'm gonna give you some more numbers here. As I say, I've been doing this almost in my sleep for the last couple of weeks, so if these aren't, uh, cogent, the fault is, is, is mine. In the last, as it's not news to any of you, that in 
uh, the last 30 years, the U.S. lost its manufacturing base. The numbers of people since 1980 employed in manufacturing uh, have gone from about 26 percent of the workforce to just above 9 percent of the workforce. And something similar has occurred in Britain, which had more people in manufacturing, about 31, nearly 31 percent of people in the workforce and doing manufacturing to 11. And Australia, which has vir virtually wiped out its manufacturing capacity. These are all neoliberal regimes, highly market oriented, and so on. One of the reasons this happened is, of course, that wages were cheaper elsewhere in the world. Uh, but it wasn't just a race to the bottom. And it's important to understand this. These weren't jobs that were taken away simply from American workers. They were surrendered by American corporations. And the difference is this, that these were seen uh, unskilled and semi-skilled jobs were seen to be uh, uh, jobs whose skills nothing could be built on. That is, that they were static forms of skill. And therefore, it wasn't a great loss to get rid of them. That we do higher level work, and we'd leave this kind of dreck uh, for the Chinese and the Indians. And that was a profound miscalculation about what people do when they have access to unskilled work which is there are circumstances under which they can begin to build businesses and activities out of what seem to be merely routine work, uh, becomes family business, becomes small local business, people learn more skills in the process of developing these businesses and so on. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but it's the story embodied by Indian call centers uh, which began as a kind of um, an, uh, a quite industrialized uh, activity, just answering the phone and so on. This is in the days before uh, uh, electronic messaging. Uh, but what happened in those call centers is people saw this as a chance to add a skill, that is to learn how to speak better English. Uh, they left the multinational call centers where, where they were, were hired, uh, took the skills and the language with them, started small family business, subcontracting businesses. And um, uh, that's now a, a domain uh, that's built up lots of work, but work which has become semi too skilled to skilled in the process of a generation. Same thing has happened with a lot of manufacturing in China. <coughs> so one of the things to understand from this history is that there was a kind of contempt for manual labor that made people, uh, the, the people who ran corporations in this country, and even more the politicians, uh, not all that concerned about protecting these jobs, because they were seen as steady state. The skills were fixed. Now, another part of this problem about skill development, so in other words, you give away people who could build up skills. Another part of this problem has to do with the service sector. And here, the issue is really one of the way in which work is organized. What's happened to, to much service labor in this country is that it's gone from being a long-term pursuit to being short-term uh, um, in character. Uh, that service work, and this is a story that's, that I'm going to tell you very, again very briefly, is. Uh, uh, as the nature of services provided has, has uh, 
changed less than, than you would think. Basic services in, in, in health care provision, for instance, running hospitals, education. Um, these are the kind of bread and butter, these kind of everyday sales. These are the kind of everyday services on which an economy builds itself up. And these have become increasingly shorter term in character and more uncertain than their employers. This is a story that intersects with the story I told in um, a Corrosion of Character about the flexibilization of capitalism, which has become its institutional forms have been more short term in character. People no longer have lifetime careers in an organization. Uh, but rather they do a series of sequential jobs that may not be r related to each other. In the service sector, what this has meant is that people are practicing the same skills for employer from employer from employer without any narrative logic of d building up those skills. The employers hire somebody to do something, which is a fixed skill activity, uh, and uh, the people are retained so long as they perform it. What's called career ladders have, have be, ha come to have increasingly weak rungs for people at the lower parts of the ladder. Now, this isn't the experience probably for most of you, because this is an elite institution, and this is an elite city. Uh, but if you were a nurse, in Sioux City, Iowa, you would uh, have the experience of, of uh, moving from hospital to hospital, never really being able to move up because the institution is only looking for short-term workers to fulfill uh, an immediate, fill an immediate hole. And what's happened, therefore, is that service work has stagnated in the kind of self-development that it offers to ordinary people. I'm, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about the elite. I'm not talking about Silicon Valley. That's another story. But for ordinary service workers, the McJob phenomenon has become modal rather than unusual. And there are all sorts of ways to measure this. I, I'm not going to uh, give you the numbers on it. But it's meant that people are getting less and less stimulation from their work. Now, I would say that these phenomena, the notion that there's really no long-term value in manual labor, and the failure of institutions to provide people uh, with a ladder for developing skills in the service economy. Uh, main, these, these are phenomena which may not explain why people's skills are as fragile as they appear in these numbers. But what they explain is a society that's not doing anything about that fragility. Right? I'm not saying these are explanatory variables, but I'm saying that they're problems which uh, our society has not done very much about. And I think, in my view, and this is only my view, one of the reasons for that lies not purely in, in economic sociology, but lies in a, a set of cultural values that have become more and more dominant in the US. And those B flat. <laughs> An iPhone and B flat, can this be? <laughs> Madam, I need to talk to you later. <laughs> it's in my other life. Um, how amazing. Anyhow, um, there is a dark side of meritocracy. We have in this country, since the Second World War, put an enormous emphasis on the talent search to find that one in 20 individual who really stands out, whether they're poor, uh, whether they've got the wrong skin color, the wrong ethnicity in terms of 
traditional American society. We've conducted a talent search in the name of meritocracy. And that cultural ethos, in my view, has created a situation of neglect. That's the dark side of it. If you're looking for the talented one and 20, what happens to the other 19? Are they equally as worthy? You've put all, as it were, your, your energy, all your e eggs, in the basket of finding this unusual person. And the result of that is that the other 19, let's say it's 1 in 20, recede into the shadows. Their needs are not accounted. They're not educated with the same care. And on the job, they're not treated uh, as, as also possessing human capital. There's a fundamental reason for this. And, and it's a very large one which is the notion in, which has grown up in modern society, which equates the ability to do good work with being unusually gifted. You know? This is a fundamental equation. Only an exceptional person can do good work. And once you take this on board, and in the course of this, God, now 40 years that I've been studying labor, I, I've heard it over and over again, how hard it is to find good workers. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of standard Jack Daniels and ICE talk with any employer. So hard to find talent, you know. Once you take that on board, you've set into motion a situation of neglect. And we've suffered from that. There are lots of sides to this. It's the dark uh, 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 side of, of, uh, of streaming in high schools, you know. Find those students, those unusual students, really get them together. Uh, take them out of this uh, situation and enable them uh, to learn. So that I think the weakness here is one which fundamentally traces itself back to a cultural root, which is the notion that talent is scarce, that good work is scarce. And the moment you make that assumption, uh, the game is up. You get a society of people whose skills, uh, whatever their native endowments, are neglected and ignored. Um, in my book, in The Craftsman, I try in the last third of the book to show why this isn't so. Why uh, the capacity to do work uh, of the sort that is required by almost all jobs in the US does not require uh, exceptional talent why anybody can do good work. And I thought in the second part of this talk, although I am speaking too long, I would try and say something to you about why I believe this is so. What makes for skill? Um, so I've described to you a situation that looks like a kind of, if you like, cultural failing that is, we spend too much money on gym equipment instead of uh, underneath that cultural failing are two really fundamental economic shifts uh, and sociological shifts in the way in which we look at the capacity of manual laborers to develop themselves and in the organizations that would help service workers, the organization of work that would help service workers. But then again, underneath that is a cultural, uh, a much deeper cultural assumption, which is that good work is scarce and that therefore society has to select out for only an elite. Very different, I have to say, than the situation in Germany or in the Scandinavian countries, which do not make those assumptions. These are neoliberal market capitalist economies that have operated in this. 
because this is so depressing, <laughs> I just want to say a little to you about, about what I think skill is about. And I'll try and go quickly on this, because I've, I've talked too much as it, as it is about this. I want to just say something about what seem to me the elements of skill, at least as you see it in ordinary craft work. Uh, the first thing about developing skill for ordinary craft workers, people who work in what we don't think of as the elite sort of jobs that Bob Reich is talking about, these symbolic manipulators, but people who do more everyday kinds of both manual and service work, is getting a skill in a craft is slow and it's long. One measure of the time it takes to become skilled in the practice of a craft is what's called the 10,000 hour rule. And this rough number, this is a rough number, but a good one, translates into practicing, for instance, three or four hours a day for five to seven years. It's the time that's needed to gain mastery, when, whether one is learning piano technique, glass blowing, a sport, or surgery. And we might ask what happens during these 10,000 hours. And in my view, three things occur. The first is embodiment. And it's the way in which, through going over it and over things again, they become not merely propositions, but part of our own behavior. Uh, I'll give you an example from, from music. A uh, student goes over scales again and again until the tones of the cello sound exactly in tune and the shifting between notes becomes seamless. Uh, that's a matter of repetition, but not of rote, and I'll explain why. Getting something right the first time you do it is not really skillful, just because you may not be able to do so the second or the tenth time. You need to ingrain facility into your body or into your mental uh, uh, processes so that it becomes a habit on which you can rely. Repetition is not a static activity. A musician practicing scales will only gradually, for instance, lighten up the finger pressure or develop more flexible action at the knuckle ridge. The body is, after all, learning an unusual habit and you develop such habits slowly. Ingraining habit, moreover, requires anyone who is engaged in embodiment to remain alert, even while doing the same procedure as in playing scales week after week or month after month. Going over something again and again, that horrible thing of conservative, that conser seemingly conservative bugbear of repetition, practicing, uh, is really how we, the practice becomes us, and it becomes unconscious to us. We know it because it's inside ourselves. Put abstractly, through practicing, we metamorphose, and so in body, put simply, we improve. It's the only way we can do it. Uh, This is, uh, and, and I've tried to show in my book how this is true for purely mental activities, although the time frame is slightly different than it is for physical activities, for which this 10,000 hour rule is pretty, is pretty solid. And this has a policy application straight away if you take on board this aspect of craft, which is the support given to people over a long term to be able to work on something again and again and again. One of the things that I found extremely depressing in the run up to this conference was uh, the notion of many of the employers who were at the work summit yesterday that they wanted quick fix uh, skills from their employees. They wanted to have like one week training sessions, you know, to, to transform an auto worker into a solar panel welder. And that's because they don't understand that nature of craft. That person wouldn't learn it. They could mimic it, they could maybe do it once. 
but embodiment takes a lot of time. And to provide that time, unfortunately, takes the money to support people in long-term training. So that's one aspect of this. The second aspect of craft skill follows directly from the first. From learning to do one thing well, there can emerge many different alternative ways uh, uh, to reach a goal. This principle is the more than one way to skin a cat rule, which I'll call the cat rule. And I'll give you an example of it. One of my students, a skilled glassblower, describes the sensory mastery which came to her in manipulating the blowpipe when she found several alternative ways to hold the pipe, always with the same goal of keeping the blob of molten glass rounded at the tip. Uh, what's involved in learning many ways to do the same thing, the cat rule, is intimately related to the first and the following way. The habits that we learn in the long, slow time of craft work are tacit understandings. We don't have to think about what we're doing. Uh, and we couldn't actually do them if we were thinking every moment, no, the next thing I do is I move my right hand and I drop it. And now I've got a cord. You know, you couldn't do that. But what the cat rule applies to comes at a sort of moment in the middle of this process, which is a conscious uh, understanding that there's another way to do something, and then pursuing that possibility, and then ingraining it again as habit through repetition. The important part about this is that skill is not monocular. If you watch a welder on, uh, at the BMW, which is a very good welding operation, the BMW Motor Works, they're welding in many, many different ways. Some of them to relieve pressure in their body. Their bodies change in different ways. They, they get under the car in different ways. Uh, sometimes they actually use different parts. Uh, when they see that a particular part is not good or they make adjustments and, and so on. This kind of flexibility, having a repertoire of skills, is even in industrialized labor a necessity. And, and of course, even more so in dealing with less defined situations, like how to make a glass bowl, or how to deal with a patient who's having a, a, a heart attack. Uh, there isn't a one-to-one -one match, in other words, between a skill which accomplishes one end. And people often make this mistake in thinking about skill development. We'll teach them how to do it is often portrayed as a kind of static situation in which there's only one way to do a given thing. Um, the reasons for this are obvious. Developing a repertoire of multiple s solutions serving the same end is important because in the artisan's realm, raw materials can vary as they do in auto manufacturing, and even more because the circumstances of practice can var vary. Think about this in sports. A football player put into a new team may have to change his or her ways of, of playing to adapt. Can't do the same thing all the time. In musical work, the physical temperature of different halls or the emotional temperature of different conductors obliges us to achieve the same goal by different means. The thing about the cat rule is that it, above all, builds up confidence. It has a terrific psychological uh, um, impact. The craftsman is confident that he or she can meet the challenges of different circumstances because he or she has developed a repertoire of techniques rather than reliant about just why, one way of doing things. So this is a deep motivational principle that if you, you know, life throws a challenge at you, that you're going to be able to respond. And again, there's a p policy implication to this. And this has been my, uh, my, my aria, my, I don't know, my, my second act aria in discussions with people in Washington. The implication of this is we should forget about best practice. Do you understand why? That is a one-to-one -one match. What's the best way to do something? 
they're all addicted to this, you know, this, uh, these guys. You take the best practice, that's a model, and then other people follow that. This is a form of de-skilling, in my view. So we have to break, in my, this is my only my own argument, but in my view, we need to break out of the mindset of best practices, which is taught in most business schools. I'm sure not at Berkeley, but uh, <laughs> everywhere else. Uh, the third element of skill that I'd like to talk to you about is less obvious than the 10,000 hour rule or the cat rule, but it's an equal in value. There is in learning a skill an intimate connection between problem solving and problem finding. Between, that is to say, once we know how to make something work, we then want to know what are its implications, what it leads to. And the difficulty is that these implications are often not immediately clear. We've generated a problematic by, by doing something. I'll give you an example of this. Um, in the early 16th century, there were new ways of mixing metals and tempering them. And these produced the first truly sharp uh, steel knives and scissors. But the butchers and barbers who bought them didn't know quite what to do with these improved tools. It took about 60 years for barbers, who as you may know also doubled as surgeons, to learn new ways, uh, new knife techniques. Uh, this is very common in the history of technology that a tool appears between, before people really know how to use it. It's the story of the modern computer whose wonderful capacities are wasted because we really don't know how to use them very well. And that's a rabbit hole I'm not going to jump down. <laughs> but it's a, basic, it's a basic issue in the history of technology that when we master a new technique, its uses, are not immediately clear. I give you another version of the, intimate, of the intimate connection between problem solving and problem finding. This is the pregnant wrong answer. The answer which often proves more productive, opening up new terrain than the quick right answer. I give you an example from weaving. The jacquard loom, you know what jacquard uh, material is? Yeah. The jacquard loom, was developed in initially by weavers in Lyon when they threaded their looms the wrong way. Something went wrong, could make the looms work. They thought about it. Uh, they pondered it. They got it to work right. And suddenly there was a material which they didn't know how to weave. They went back and worked on the looms again. And eventually we got this amazing uh, material. Um, you understand what the problem is immediately here. We have educational regimes for finding talent, which are mostly based on multiple choice uh, tests. God forbid, and this is a very serious issue, God forbid a kid got interested in one of the wrong answers on a multiple choice test. That kid would appear stupider than the one who amassed enough right answers. And yet, in the development of skill, it's dwelling in, a, in that kind of problem, working it out, trying to get it right, if you can, or seeing why it can't be put right, which is also all, uh, often the way in which we, we advance. This is a basic principle of, of scientific uh, research. But the way we search for talent uh, doesn't enable them. The intimate, ambiguous relation between problem solving and problem finding, uh, to put it another way, enables curiosity. No skill develops without a good dose of curiosity, which enables us to think about what might be rather than what is, like the barbers, or again to become self-critical, like the weavers. Uh, 
And maybe a way to end this part of what I'm talking to you about is that these, all of these skills should give us pause over the resonance of the word mastery. Mastery of a medium is not a static condition. Think, for instance, of Matisse in 1915. He's struggling with the color black. The people around him are saying he's a great colorist, the greatest colorist of our time, and so on. But he knew better. He knew that he, his control over color had opened up only new questions. This is a fundamental phenomenon of mastery. It's true in more prosaic work uh, as well. And it's why a good deal of measure of anxiety attends much highly skilled labor because people are asking, what next? What can I do with it? It might seem odd to join worry of this sort to the kind of self-confidence that people have in dealing with the cat problem. Yet in the real world, a practice they do marry. Again, the issue of repetition as well appears, but now in a productive form. Uh, the person who has acquired skill, mastery, be a potter, nurse, or a Stradivarius, does not usually want to do something perfectly once and then retire. She wants to do it again, from which follows, what then? So these are, in my view, sort of fundamentals of skill development, which uh, we need to pursue in our society. And to do them, and this is what I'd like to end with, we have to make the process of developing skill less competitive. That is, these are, skill does not develop as a demonstration. It's something other than a, a demonstration. And I think until we address these problems, uh, we aren't going to have a society in which people want to become more skilled, in which if they're having tr adding, trouble adding up a checkbook, they want to do something about it. Uh, people who have that kind of disability often think, well, I'm just, I'm no one. You know, I, I'll never get it. I'll never understand it. So true with computers, too. So there is a kind of disabling that comes out of, I think, competition, which is put into the realm of skill development. And this is why I don't find it very surprising that places like Scandinavia or the Netherlands, which put a high premium on cooperation, are places in which people develop skills. You know, if people have a problem, other people help them. Uh, people are not afraid to say, oh, no. You know, they're not going to be punished uh, for saying, I don't get it, or I made a mistake. You know, they're different cultures in that they're less, com they're in some ways highly competitive, but competition is not a applied to the domain of skill building. Now, there's no policy that I can recommend <laughs> to myself or to you about how we could become a less competitive society, a more cooperative society. But somehow we have to find that, that solution if we want to do something about really building up a, a more skilled society. So to just wrap this up in terms of the theme of this talk, the decline of the skilled society is inevitable as long as we continue in the patterns of competition uh, in which we followed in the past. That's my theme to you. So that's what I want to say to you. I'd love to get some responses from you or uh, argue with me. I can't say I'm going to be very lucid about argument, but I, I would very much like to get some response. Can you can you speak loudly? I have a microphone and you don't. Oh, do you have a microphone? Ah, I should have known. The Thompson Center. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, you, you fail to take into account the finding the exceptional person, the Steve Jobs or the Eric Schmidt yeah. or, the, or, the, or the Gates. And what they do is they create more skilled jobs and more skilled technology and more capital to invest in other skilled operations than any other nation in the world. The reason we get all the Nobel Prize winners and, and lead in, in, in so many industries is not because we're training plumbers how to become carpenters. It's because we're concentrating on high-tech kind of jobs that, that have a lot of replications and build a lot of, of these skill jobs that you talk about. Uh, well, this is a very good question. Maybe I'll take your microphone. But no, no, I'll come back here. It's a very good question. You understand the notion is, where does, where does new work come from? It comes from innovation at the top. I wish that were true. I mean, statistic, I, and I, I, I appreciate very much what you're saying, and I'm not making an argument against uh, Steve Jobs, uh, against Microsoft, uh, whether, whether that is quality work, that's another story. <laughs> uh, but I think the issue is something like, like, like this. Um, I give you a British example of it, just to make something that's less familiar to us. Uh, Britain uh, developed and invested in the technology uh, of the, in the basic science that led to the development of wind turbines. Those wind turbines, which are British creations, are manufactured in Denmark. By analogy, Many of the computers that we use are ma not manufactured in the US. There's a great big glitch that occurs in technology work between creation at the top and the actual execution of this in terms of, of making jobs. And statistically, the data is pretty robust about this. Uh, and it comes out of the phenomenon that I was describing to you before, that when you get down to, to the fabrication level, it's seen as a kind of trivial problem. Anybody can do it. Now, that's what's bad for us has been great for the developing world. You know? The Chinese are the beneficiaries of exactly the mindset I'm talking about. And why not? If I were Chinese, I'd do exactly the same thing. But the point is, for us, what we're not doing is creating a situation in which our people, ordinarily, are getting the benefit of what gets done at the top. This is, a, it's a systematic, uh, it's not just America. It happens, as I say, in the UK. It's happen, happening now with a lot of biotech, where the actual tech in the biotech is leaving this country. And it's not just a matter of uh, that it's cheaper to do somewhere, to, to manufacture it somewhere else. It is in part. But it's also that we're so focused on the elite work that we don't focus on the mass benefit. So that's an argument you and I have. Of course. Well, that's a whole other, other story. I'm willing to move to Shanghai any time, but that's a whole other story. I'm just saying, in terms of the problem you pose, that the execution of, tech, of technological innovation is not occurring in the countries uh, where, uh, uh, where it's happened. So this is a good issue to bring up. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'll take the same position that the last speaker took. Ah, uh, yes, I've been the heart of Silicon Valley. I can see. That's it. right. <laughs> well, um, well, the industry of California is creating industries. Essentially, a lot of people came here with the gold rush, and then it's produced mining equipment, yeah. it's produced 
innumerable things biotech. Um, U.S. has, you know, the top universities in the world. So essentially, uh, it has yeah. that skill set. That's its competitive advantage. But it's not, the vision is not diffusing down. You know, people at Berkeley, people in the high tech, actually know what it takes to do, to make these things. And yet, um, when they make proposals, they get blocked by the mindset you say, which is sort of a tail Taylorist, Fordist uh, right. thing that's attuned to a century ago. And uh, um, it's like we have this no, no child left behind. Well, that's designed essentially not to help the, the upper tail or the lower tail. And right. there's policy after policy uh, which fail because the people, sort of the bureaucratic structures that dominate the whole educational system uh, up to the university level essentially won't take the leads of reforming from the people who really know what the skills are needed to, right. to make this but, you know, I, th I, th I think where you and I are part ways is that this, your, your view is a very top-down one. And my view is, um, I guess I could put it this way, whatever happens from the top-down that you've got to generate within the body of society good ways for people to make a living. I'm looking at this in a totally different, different, different way. Not how, not how people can benefit from what the best do, but how they can you know, generate from within themselves uh, a way of living that uses the talents that they have. And I don't think the way that you develop the talents within yourself is by having a model of something that's, you know, the very best, the most excellent you can get, uh, the most elite, and saying, I'm going to try and get as close as I can to that. Um, I mean, you would have to take on board, I think, the notion that sort of being the first or being innovative is not necessarily the same thing as making a, a workforce in which most people are benefiting. And we don't have that mindset. We use words like innovation, you know, advance. Uh, these are all things which are, are, if you put yourself in the position of somebody who is a nurse, are relatively abstract to her. She's got another set of problems. She doesn't need the latest equipment. She needs a job in which maybe she has a career ladder where you know, she can build on the skill that she's been doing to do something a We're little better. We're completely in agreement on that. Essentially what I'm saying is, yes, you want to build that skill ladder where, where the people above right. are teaching their skills consciously to the people below, and that goes all the way down, but that there has to be the structure for that yeah. to happen. You, you have some disagreement in the back. Let's. Uh, uh, no, the woman behind you, please. <laughs> no, you've lost. Uh, let her speak. I just wanted to shift gears a bit and address what you're talking about. About um, uh, when you talk about the Scandinavian countries yeah. and how they. Uh, work together, this, this, this thought ah, of cooperation. So you, want to, you actually want to move away from this. Oh, go ahead. OK, go, go ahead. We'll is come that back okay? to this. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is also connected to our health care system. We live in a country where we don't look out for each other. It's yeah. a port of uh, a corporate competition. And so there's a, there's a greater shift that needs to be addressed in what you're talking about. If we're all going to advance, we have to pay attention to not only the skills we're producing, but how we're taking care of each other. And re in regards to Steve Jobs, he <laughs> was not um, considered a success. He found his way um, That's af true. after yeah. failing in the academic system. And uh, after failing, wasn't there early Apple also a yeah, that's yeah. True. No, he did not do well in yeah. our academic system. Well, let me put 
Let, let me say back to you, because you've, you've raised a really important issue, and say it back to you in maybe a more scholarly way. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the 1870s, Bismarck made what was called the social compact with labor in Germany. And this became the model for pretty much the way in which northern European countries, and Bismarck was no Marxist, believe me, uh, a way in which northern Euro European countries looked at the issue of labor in general, and this labor in, in particular. Bismarck wanted to head off revolution. He wanted to have a social compact in which workers thought that they got something by uh, uh, being able to have a voice with employers. This is where the German system of co-determination comes, comes, comes up. There are workers' councils, not often unions, although there are some, uh, who are involved in the manage, management of enterprises along with, with executives. And the one thing we know about this Bismarckian pact is that it had a far more energizing effect on developing the skills of workers who are in those German industries than, this is work a student of mine did making, this is why I say this is an academic thing. She compared the Hawthorne experiment, you know what that is, about motivating workers, done in the 1930s in General Electric. She actually looked at the productivity gains of the Hawthorne experiment versus what happened in Germany by the 1890s with this social compact. And she found the productivity gains were much higher in this northern European system because people, the workers were much more stimulated about doing the work well, about doing a good job. It was something that served the collectivity of the organization. That's a very un-American idea. Um, and it's why I say, I think that what's really hidden in restoring a vigorous econ uh, workforce to this country, not a vigorous economy, we can restore the capitalist system, everybody can get their bonuses, we're not talking about that. But to make a workforce in which people are able to have a better experience of work, we have to get out of the mindset that basically work is a competitive activity. And there are so many non-Marxist -so uh, versions of this. You know. The Wallenbergs, for instance, are Swedish manufacturers, a fantastic manufacturing firm in Sweden after the war, who took, uh, took up this same idea that a firm has to be co co a cooperative in some way. It's the only way that workers are going to want to get better at what they do. And they, they, um, they built a fantastic uh, uh, industry on this. When I was in Detroit uh, in December, I went out as part of a sort of little fact-finding team. Um, all I heard in one of the firms, which I'm not going to name to you, was a discussion about which executive was at fault in the fact that the firm was in trouble. It was all up here, that if there had been another kind of boss in control, they would never have gotten into these problems. They almost never talked about uh, the workers. You know? and that kind of, you know, who was incompetent and so on. There was never the notion that this was really a collaborative enterprise. Uh, I think that's quite a general, general attitude in American uh, business. And it's, it's, what I'm saying to you is it's self-destructive, you know, and we're living with it, you know. I think we're actually on the same wavelength on this. Can we have two more questions and then I, I think, I, I don't know, somehow my energy is going. Yes, this man back here. You, you.
No, I think your, um, your approach is far superior to your critics in this audience. I'm, you didn't realize No, no, that's a say. very competitive thing to say. <laughs> yeah, all right. You lost enough. the floor. Forget it. <laughs> but it's really a political statement. I mean, this is, you didn't realize you were entering into a neoliberal community. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, I think your, your um, argument could be strengthened a bit by moving away from sort of national character or national uh, origins arguments to recognize a, a history to this. Yeah. And that the Industrial Revolution in Britain, as well as the United States, was really an artisanal revolution. I think it was Raph Samuel that pointed out that only about 15% of all workers most of the 19th century in Britain were actually at yeah, in factories. In, right. And yet what they produced was an extraordinary yeah. revolution in productivity. Yeah. Oh, you can I'll let it. you talk. This is all music. This is all right, all right. <laughs> so yeah. what we should be looking at here, yeah. I think, are policy shifts. Um, <clears throat> the emergence of Fordism, for example, in the 20s and 30s. Um, the shifts in national policy, which deprived us or cut us off even from the memory of an artisanal and cooperative society. Well, this is a very interesting issue that you raise. And um, uh, it, it, and it's absolutely uh, correct. I, I was in, um, last month I was in northern Italy. Italy as a, as a nation is a basket case, as you know, economically. But northern Italy is not. And it has, like southern Germany, uh, uh, what are called um, a highly developed craft uh, sector, uh, running from machine tools to furniture making to to specialist papers. I mean, a huge raft of these things. They're called these workshops are called um, uh, Mittelstander in in German. That is that they're family-owned businesses of fifty to hundred people. And they have no unemployment. And uh, many of them have no debt. Uh, but they're overwhelmed with, uh, with orders. Their problem is getting credit out of the banks. Uh, it's often thought, I mean, that craft work, small scale craft work, falls inevitably to large enterprise. And I think this, what this gentleman is raising is that, that that is mistaken, that you can run a very vigorous society, which is composed of smallish, not super small, not candy store size, but these 50 to 100 uh, person, very specialized firms have done very well because there's demand for what what they do, and they've articulated over about a 70-year period little niches that they reliably fill. They have long-term relations to their suppliers, uh, whom they are cutting slack to, in, and their customers in the, uh, the downturn and so on. So the notion that craft work is a kind of doomed activity to be replaced by just this pair of hands or by Harvard Business School you know, graduates is wrong. It can make societies very, very strong. And um, again, we look, often we, we make the error of thinking the bigger a firm gets, the better it's going to turn out to be. We make that error at the moment uh, when the firms seek, you know, public financing, you know, and stocks and so on. And then they become beholden to a very different kind of logic of growth and size and productivity than these firms which have no stock, you know. They have no IPOs. So there, uh, this is a really, uh, this is a very valuable contribution. Can we take one final question from you? You look like a student. <laughs> oh, you're oh, not a student. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm, I have I'm a question. On the other end. Oh, the other end. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, wrong to talk like you have on the one hand, you must choose between a society which produces uh, excellence in the form of Nobel Prize winners and such like, and a society which um, uh, provides skills for ordinary folks. Yeah. The, the counter example here is Germany in early last century. The first third of that century, Germany pro uh, got one third of all Nobel Prizes. Yeah. And we're leading in, co in, the, in, in, co in the combination of research and industry. Yeah. And at the same time, they had a very good vocational training program for ordinary workers. Of course, I mean, this, this was in many ways a horrible society, very militaristic, very hierarchical, and so on, but it had these redeeming qualities. Yeah. At least they managed to, to yeah. combine these two aspects uh, superior skills in the universities and Right, right. Really good skills for ordinary folks. Well, you know, m maybe I'm in the drift of all of this conversation. Sort of comes back to Christ. Then I have a question. For you. Maybe this is a question for drinks, because uh, <laughs> I want to understand why you're broke. But uh, <laughs> um, what neoliberalism did was propose. Uh, a single model of growth, and that was a finance-led model, you know? Uh, and maybe what we have to grapple with is not going back to that notion that finance drives uh, the so-called real economy. Uh, and I think the chances of that happening in Europe are great of not going back to that model. And I think the chances in this country are not so great at the moment. Because uh, many of the people in the present administration would like to see the old regime restored with a little more control. So, you know, there is a divide between the way in which Europeans are beginning, uh, the British above, above all, because they've lost the most in this recent debacle, are thinking about the role of finance and the way we're thinking about it in this country. Now, I'd be, be wrong about that, because you know, Washington looks very different. It may be that there'll be some kind of popular movement that puts, um, that says enough to this. But most of the cash, has been, uh, one of my assistants has been spent on finance. One of my assistants batted out, if we hadn't have supported AIG, what the money could have been used for in terms of tr training and education programs. It's, uh, and he's gonna put it on the web. It's quite amazing what $160 billion <laughs> buys in, in terms of worker, no, it's a serious thing. It went like that. It went like that, you know. So, I that's what I, I, I that I think is a, basically the, the the problem. We we just can't have a restoration of the ancien regime, but we've had it. You know, and that's that's the problem. Maybe there'll be some other political movement. Maybe some intelligent Republican. Well, I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyhow, I want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs>